Yeah, <laughs> Amos, as you know, is professor of information theory at ETH Zurich. And uh, before that, he was in the faculty of the electrical, and, uh, electrical engineering and computer science department at MIT. Uh, he received his undergraduate degrees in math and also in electrical engineering at the Technion and his PhD at Stanford. Uh, Amos uh, uh, well, is a renowned for his contributions to information theory and communication theory. And I try to list some of the things. Uh, his work spans a wide range. Yeah, I want some uh, yeah, right, to be able to talk. So, and this is not a complete list. Boston communication channel, optical communication, mismatch decoding, compound channels, uh, communication over feeding channels, and he's, he's well known for his pre log factor, and uh, multiple access channel with feedback, states, uh, broadcast channel, joint source channel coding. Gaussian watermarking and so on. And I don't want to list everything. And this is only a subject. Uh, he's the author of a book, A Foundation in, in Digital Communication, that was published by Cambridge University Press in 2009. Now, today he's going to speak on the role of Rene entropy. And uh, this is especially welcome because, as Amos writes in his abstract, it is believed that Rene entropy is a fun fundamental concept in information theory. Although its operational significance has not been as compelling as, as that of entropy. And it's been acknowledged that, that Rene information measures, such as Rene information and Rene divergence, do play a role in information theory. Uh, but for some reason, we don't teach them in our classes. And these are beautiful <coughs> concepts, but also very beguiling. For instance, there's no acknowledged notion of Rene mutual information. There are many concepts of those. So this talk is very timely, and we're looking forward to it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's uh, wonderful to, give, uh, to see so many friends in the audience. It's uh, thrilling to see such uh, eminent information theorists here, and it's terrifying to see my son in the audience. <laughs> okay, um, this is joint work with uh, uh, Christoph Bunte, and I'll get to uh, the problem uh, right away. Um, <coughs> If your spouse is off to the airport and wishes uh, to remind you of a task that you need to do, and your spouse is going to use a fixed number of bits uh, to remind you to do one task. So these are the rules of the game. It's going to be a fixed number of bits, and there's one task that you have to do. There's a whole list. It could be not to forget to feed the cat, not to, go, not to forget to go to the dry cleaners, etc., etc., get the in-laws at the airport, and so forth. And the question is how to actually do this. Um, and of course, there's a combinatorial approach that information theorists frown upon, but it's, it's good. It says that you can always do that with log of the number of tasks. Uh, so this will give you a perfect description of a task that you need to be reminded of. And it guarantees that you will know uh, what to do. So there's something to be said for that. But of course, information theorists uh, frown upon this because they realize that there's a lot of redundancy here. All the tasks start with uh, honey, don't forget to, etc. So we want to somehow exploit that. So um, the information theoretic approach uh, is to model the tasks as elements of, of x to the n, so sequences over the finite alphabet of x, generated I and EP. And then what we do is we ignore the uh, atypical uh, sequences. We index the typical sequences. Those are, there are uh, that requires uh, n times the entropy number of bits, and we send the index or so the description of the uh, <coughs> typical task that uh, you're required to do. And of course, the idea is that if you have, if r is larger than the entropy of x, then uh, the typical tasks will be communicated error free. Mm -hmm. So this is the information theoretic approach, and of course. Um, any married person will tell you that this is completely ludicrous. Um, I mean, what if the task is not typical? So we always teach our students not to worry about non-typical things, but this is not one of those cases. Uh, yes, it's unlikely that the task is going to be atypical, but one thing is you won't even know that it's an atypical task, so you might end up you know, uh, going to the dry cleaners and forgetting your spouse's parents uh, at the airport. And of course, the big question is, uh, are you OK with the consequences of, of this uh, screw? And um, that's the big question that we want to ask today. 
So of course there's the improved information theoretic approach where the first bit that your spouse sends indicates whether it's a typical or non-typical uh, task. And now you'll know when the task is lost in transmission. So you know uh, that your spouse actually wanted to send you an uh, atypical task. Uh, but that doesn't help you that much because the question is, what are you going to do about it? So now you know that the task has been essentially lost in the transmission. And the question is what to do about it. Um, I can tell you what I would do. So I, I, I would um, panic and do all of it. So uh, I would actually end up performing all the tasks just because I know it was lost in the transmission. Or if you like, only the atypical ones. On an exponential scale, that's the same as all the tasks. And I do realize that uh, there are exponentially many of them. Um, and at this point, I see that my is getting a little bit worried, which is exactly the approach, that, what I was hoping for. And we start worrying not about the probability of an atypical sequence, but we start worrying about the expected number of tasks that we're going to end up performing. That's a completely different number. Okay. Of course, so what you could do is you could perform a subset of the tasks. Okay. I suggested to do all of them, you could uh, choose a subset. Uh, you get brownie points maybe for the extra effort. And say, so, gee, I really, I went to the dry cleaner, I picked up, uh, I went to the kids violin lesson and so forth. But, you know, if the task was to pick up the parents at the airport and you didn't do it, you're in trouble. So the problem is, of course, what happens if the subset doesn't contain the task that you were requested to do? And of course, we have a problem. And again, we come back to the question of whether you're okay with the consequences. I would not be. So if, instead, what I want is that if I perform a subset of the tasks, I want to be sure that it contains the task that was assigned. And this is what I'll call uh, error-free uh, communication or uh, compression. And here's what the problem is all about. So we still take an idealistic mathematical approach. Um, we now assume that a source generates a sequence xn iid according to some distribution p. We describe the sequence, i.e. the task, using nr bits, so it's a fixed number of bits. And now, based on the description, unlike in the case of data compression, where we uh, try to reproduce um, <coughs> the uh, sequence that was generated by the source, here we generate a list, or what I called earlier a subset. And we insist that this list will contain the task that was assigned to us, in other words, the sequence that was generated, i.e. exit. So the reconstruction now is a subset. And the question is, for which rates R can we uh, find descriptions and corresponding lists with expected um, list size arbitrarily close to 1? We can't do better than 1, because I'm afraid there is a task that needs to be done. Uh, so it's at least 1, but we don't want to perform too many of them. We want this to be an expected value close to 1. And more generally, we'll see that it's actually a little bit nicer and more and cleaner to look at the rowth moment of the list size. So this is what we do. Um, it's not just because I want to try to impress you with math. It actually ends up being, there's a good reason for this. And it's going to come home. Now, of course, some people in the audience may not be in a relationship. And maybe they're not interested in this problem. So should you tune out? And I'd like to convince you not to do so, or at least not quite yet. Uh, because it turns out that the answer is related to um, uh, Remy's entropy. Uh, so here's uh, Alfred Remy, who has given a definition of the Remy entropy of uh, order alpha. And as Pakash mentioned, this is something that information theorists uh, generally agree that is fundamental and important, but somehow it's a little bit difficult sometimes to find a compelling uh, example of when it is useful. And so what I usually do when I when I teach a class on information theory, I excuse me, yeah. one of our <coughs> applies to the law or to the argument of the law. I, I'm actually going to write it a little bit differently. So to, it's it, it's uh, uh, let's see because it applies to the argument. You can take it out. No, so I must have a type of here somewhere. No, so it is, it is, it, no, no, you're right. So what happens is it's actually one by one minus alpha. 
log of the sum of the probability to the pi alpha. So one over alpha can be removed <laughs> from there and the alpha and the, in the numerator and the factor. Right. Okay. So it's just one by one minus alpha. I, I don't like this. Um, I'm, I'm going to change this soon to row anyway, but you're absolutely right. Um, so what I usually do is I give the definition and I give it as an exercise to show that the limit is alpha tends to one of uh, Bernese entropy tends to Shannon's entropy. And then we can look at what happens when alpha tends to zero. We get log of the support set and the probability distribution and what happens when alpha tends to infinity. It turns out, it turns out to be kind of a boring, mindless exercise in using L'Hopital's rule to, to take derivatives. Um, we'll see that the problem that I described to you actually gives an operational meaning to this problem. So, um, and this is the parametrization that I prefer. So it's going to be h of 1 over 1 plus 1 <coughs> a positive rho, which corresponds to alpha between 0 and 1. So I, I have to limit myself to the range here. So for this range, this turns out to be of some operational significance. And we'll see that this operational uh, characterization actually reveals many of the properties that I just listed in a very intuitive way. And also, um, this gives us a way to motivate some definition of conditional Rényi entropy. Now, usually we don't teach about a conditional Rényi entropy, uh, but I want to, to use this problem to actually uh, talk a little bit about that also. So this is something that's coming uh, along, so now move on. Okay. So let me give you a more precise uh, definition of, of the problem that we have. So as I said, the source sequence is generated ID according to a distribution P. Uh, we describe it using NR bits. So this is the encoding function. Uh, it's a description of the n length sequences to um, uh, 1 for 2 to the NR, so NR bits. And now we have a reconstruction or a, or a decoding, which is a mapping from these bits into subsets of uh, source sequences. And we insist that the code is going to be lossless. And it's lossless in the sense that we're guaranteed that if we take the task or the source generated, the sequence generated by the source, we describe it. And based on the description, we generate a subset of uh, tasks. We're guaranteed that it will be an element of that subset. So this is the the lossless property. We're guaranteed that the task is going to be among those that we go ahead and, and do <coughs> And uh, here we have the list size in terms of with these uh, definitions. So what we're looking at is the um, if xn is drawn iid according to the distribution p, this is its description. This is the list size. Uh, I'm sorry, this is the list that is reconstructed. And the cardinality of that I denote by bars, raised to the power of rho gives me uh, rho th the power of the list, expectation is the rho form. And this is what I'm interested in. And uh, the main result regarding the lossless of this source code is the following theorem that says that if the rate is above Bernese entropy with parameter 1 over 1 plus rho, then there exists a sequence of encoders and decoders such that the um, rho th moment of the list tends to 1, as n tends to infinity. And if your rate is uh, smaller than this uh, Rémy entropy, then the expected, uh, then the Rolf moment is going to go tend to infinity as the uh, uh, length of the sequence n tends to infinity. So as n tends to infinity, so these are the two cases. If your rate is above Rémy entropy, <coughs> you can drag it to 1. And if it's uh, below, no matter what you do, you end up with a uh, the growth moment and the infinity. Okay, so let me uh, uh, show you, before I give a proof, I'd like to use uh, this characterization or this theorem to derive some of the uh, properties that I promised. So the first property is that I mentioned is that it's not decreasing in row. And of course that's uh, pretty obvious because uh, the, uh, the list size is greater or equal to one. And raising something to the row power is a monotonically increasing function in row. So uh, essentially, the mapping from row to a to the row is uh, monotonic when uh, a is greater or equal to one. So if you can get the second moment to be uh, close to one, and also the first moment is going to be close. Um, now, I also promised you that the uh, Rémy entropy is upper bounded by log of the cardinality of x and lower bounded by uh, Shannon entropy. 
This is also fairly straightforward to see from this uh, characterization uh, for the following reason. If your rate is below Shannon's entropy, then I claim that with probability tending to 1, your list size is going to be at least 2. Let me argue this a little bit more slowly. Um, if you have nr bits and you have a lossless code, then the number of sequences that are going to be reconstructed as a singleton, or you just do once, can be at most 2 to the nr. And if you have 2 to the nr sequences where r is smaller than Shannon's entropy, then their probability is going to tend to 0. So the probability that uh, your list size is going to be equal to 1 must tend to 0 by the AEP. So it's the, the part of the AEP that uh, sometimes is called converse. <laughs> any size, a, any subset of the sequences of size uh, 2 to the n row, uh, 2 to the n r when r is smaller than the entropy can have a weight which tends to, which must tend to 0 as n tends to infinity. Now, if your list size is greater equal to 2, with probability tending to 1, then the uh, uh, Roth moment is not going to tend to 0. It's not going to tend to 1. Therefore, this precludes the possibility with, uh, of uh, coding with a uh, rate smaller than Shannon's entropy. And of course, if you allow a rate which is log of the cardinality of the x, then you can guarantee list size of size 1 using the combinatorial approach. So clearly, uh, when the entropy has to be or, or the answer to our question has to be between Shannon's uh, entropy and log of the cardinality of x. Uh, with regard to what happens when rho tends to a zero, this situation is also fairly straightforward. Uh, the point is, what you want to show is that if you're looking at the rho moment when rho is very, very small, then you can be just a little bit above the entropy and you'll be fine. Uh, the point is that if you're um, if your rate is above the uh, entropy, then the probability of an uh, atypical sequence decays exponentially. And uh, in other words, you can guarantee that the probability of the list size being greater than or equal to 2 will decay exponentially. And uh, this exponential decay is going to beat uh, even e to the n rho log x. So on expectation, you will get uh, something that tends to 1. In other words, what you can do is the following scheme. If your uh, sequence is typical, then just reconstruct it as a singleton. And if it's not typical, do all the tasks. And this scheme will actually give you an expected uh, um, uh, growth moment uh, tending to 1 when rho is very, very small. And so small that uh, the, the exponential increase in the list size is much slower than the exponential decay of the probability of getting an atypical sequence. OK, finally, what happens when rho tends to infinity? You want to argue that you essentially need log of the support p. Um, that's actually uh, also fairly straightforward. It's a simple application of the pigeonhole principle. So if your rate is smaller than the log of the uh, support set, then there must exist some sequence for which uh, the corresponding list size is going to be at least e to the n log the support of p uh, minus r. And this set, I'm sorry, this sequence is the probability which is lower bounded by some p min raised to the power of n, the smallest uh, point mass in the support. <coughs> and if you then write out what the list size is, this is what the, uh, the moment is, or the uh, growth moment. And when um, r is very, very large, you won't be able to drive this to, uh, to 1 unless your, uh, if your rate is smaller than this. Can I ask you something? Yeah. I mean, could you run this analytically without invoking? Yes. The, uh, you can do all this analytically. So this is the exercise that I give. You just uh, do local rules. And if you like, this is a uh, Proofs for information theories. But yes, you could do all of that. OK, so these are the, the properties that I promised you. Let me give you a sketch of the direct part of this uh, theorem. Uh, the idea is the following. Our source is drawn IADP. But of course, there's a certain probability that the sequence generated by it will have a type Q, which is different from P. Uh, this is the probability that we see here. So the probability that we'll get 
type Q is roughly 2 to the minus uh, the relative energy. So what we're going to do is the following. We look at the type for each Q. We look at the type class TQ. And we divide it into 2 to the NR lists of roughly equal length. And we can't do it exactly because there's a rounding issue. Um, so uh, this is uh, what uh, I mean by, by roughly. So it's a question of the seeding. So we want this to be roughly 2 to the N h of q minus r. Why can I do this? Because the number of sequences in tq that have type q is roughly 2 to the n <coughs> h of q, the entropy of q. And I have 2 to the n r uh, lists at my disposal. So the ratio of the two is 2 to the n h of q minus r. So how is the coding scheme going to work? Well, if I want to describe uh, the task x, first I describe the type of x. And since there is a polynomial number of types, that doesn't cost me much. So describing the type is not a big deal. And afterwards, or appended to that, I describe the list containing this uh, task xn. And I use that using nr bits. So look at these, which subset of TQ contains the task, and that requires um, uh, NR bits. And now uh, the probability, uh, or, or the, um, if I want to look now at the uh, mo uh, growth moment of the list size, what it's going to be <coughs> is the sum of all possible uh, types, Q, the probability that the task is the type Q, times the list that I produce when the type is Q. When the type is Q, the, uh, uh, the list size is roughly uh, 2 to the n h of Q minus r. And of course, I have to raise that to the row of power, because this is uh, the list size raised to the row of power. And uh, because there's a polynomial number of types uh, Q, this is essentially dominated by the worst exponent. Uh, and the worst exponent is what I put here in maps over Q. So uh, what I get is where this delta n counts for the polynomial number of types and so forth. That's not really so interesting. So in other words, I upper bound this sum by the largest uh, term. And I get that the achievability, so this whole term over here is going to tend to 0. And I will get expected length of expected uh, growth moment 1 uh, if r is uh, smaller than, if r is larger than the max Q, H of Q minus rho inverse DQ. And it turns out, and I, I, I'll come back to this a little bit later, that this is an expression that was studied by Ali Khan many years ago. <coughs> and he showed that this uh, variational, or this uh, optimization problem gives you Renis entropy of order 1 over 1 plus rho. It, it's, it's, it's not very difficult to do. Basically, what you can do is, if you're interested in this maximization, use the Lagrange multipliers with the Kuhn-Tucker conditions, and you will get this expression. So this shows you that with this simple scheme, you can actually um, <coughs> describe the task using each of one of the one bits per, per, per uh, source symbol. OK. Uh, if you like, yeah, this, there's something nice about this scheme, and it's also something that I don't like so much. It's actually a universal scheme. because. Uh, I didn't really need to know the, the distribution of key to actually employ this. But this is not important. Don't want to go. OK, now I want to talk about the converse. The converse um, requires a, a lemma. So the converse says that you can't actually drive your, that if your rate is above, I'm sorry, if your rate is below uh, this uh, the entropy, then the rope moment will tend to infinity as n tends to infinity. Uh, the key is the following lemma. It says that if you have any probability mass function p on a finite set uh, x, and suppose you have a partition of that set into n different subsets. So this is L1 through Ln. And now let's associate with each outcome x L of x to be the size of the subset that contains x. So because we're looking here at a partition of x of script x, okay, every outcome is going to fall inside one of those lists. And there's going to be some length associated with it. And this is what we're interested in. L of x is the length of the 
subset that contains x. And it says that if you look at the rowth moment of that, so uh, you look ten, take n raised to the power of rho of x and average that over x, this is lo lower bounded by something of this nature. It has just uh, two important things in it. It has the PMFP, of course rho, and the number of subsets in it. This is the uh, dilemma. Uh, the proof turns out to be uh, fairly simple. Well, I'll just give it a simple um, one slide proof of this lemma, just to show you that there's not a whole lot going on here. Before I do that, let me give you a simple identity that is almost obvious. But let's <coughs> do it anyway. It says that if you sum over all the x's, all the outcomes, 1 over L of x, you actually get exactly n. n is the number of subsets. It looks like magic, but it's actually true. Um, because what happens is that if you sum over all the x's, 1 over L of x, then you can separate it out and sum over all the uh, x's in, in the subset j, and then run over j from 1 to n. So instead of running over all the sequences x, you can just write it out in this form. Um, all the x's that are in the list are in the subset of j, and then sum that over all the j's. Now, of course, if x is in Lj, uh, then 1 over L of x is just 1 over the cardinality of the set of j. And this sum is over Lj elements, uh, the cardinality of x Lj elements. So this is actually 1. So what I have is sum from j from 1 to n over 1, and I get it. Uh, there's nothing deep here. This is really good. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Why are you interested in the uh, rough moment? Why is it interesting the list side? I, I could do it if you like. You can limit everything to rho equals one. You know, get things. But it turns out that I want to understand this relationship with Rene entropy, and there you have this parameter rho. So somehow this rho is is interesting. But everything goes through. So why not uh, do it for a rough moment, and then uh, to better see the relationship between this and uh, Rene entropy. OK, so we know that 1 over n of x is equal to m. And now, uh, just so that you won't say that I didn't give you a proof, here's uh, the proof of the lemma. Uh, it's basically two lines, because this one doesn't count. This is just to remind you of Henderson and quality. And it's just a rearrangement of terms in using this fact. That, that's really all there is to it. So uh, here's uh, Henderson and quality. Now uh, we raise it to the power of uh, rho. Oh, P, in this case it's P. So um, this is where this P comes from, this is where this P comes from, and um, uh, this P, dis this one over P disappears, so this is just delta raised to the power of uh, P, and now you choose certain parameters to make it work. There's a different way of proving it in for information theory is they stick it in an exponent and get the log, and use Jensen here, and Jensen there, and it's too. Actually, this is really just good. OK, so um, <coughs> once we have this lemma, I claim that the converse is trivial. So um, this is the lemma. Okay, this is the lemma that we had. We have here x, uh, number, the length of the uh, cardinality of the set that contains uh, x, the rowth moment is lower bounded by this expression. So what we do now is the first thing we do is that we claim that without loss of generality, can assume that if you give me a certain description, the subset of tasks uh, that I will perform is all those tasks whose description with this given description. <coughs> In other words, if the description was zero, 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 and there's a different task which is go to the dry cleaners with description zero, zero, one, I'm not going to go to the dry cleaners because I know I got zero, zero, zero. So I'm only going to perform the tasks whose description is n. So lambda of n is the set of tasks or the subset that I will perform. I uh, only do the, I, I, I only put in the sub, in the construction subset those tasks whose description is n. And this is pretty obvious. Otherwise, just throw it out the ones that that are have this different description that only reduces the exponential <coughs> or the, the row form. This is pretty obvious. But now what happens is that these lists. <coughs> of these um, subsets uh, corresponding to the different uh, messages are now a partition 
of all the possible tasks. Okay, so now we're in business uh, because uh, what I'm interested in is in the subset um, of uh, corresponding to the description of Xn. This is just a list containing Xn. And this is exactly the setting of the lemma that we just had. Okay, so what I'm interested in is, just compare this with this. I'm, I'm going to apply the lemma to x to the n, the sequences of length n. So what I have here is the expected list, row, or the row moment of the list that contains x. And on the right hand side I have here, what I've written out here, this is the same thing except with x re replaced by x to the n. And instead of m, I say 2 to the n r. And if you do that, you, you actually get this. So this is the lower bound of the expected um, or the rough moment of the list. And you see immediately that if um, R uh, is smaller than uh, the Renyi entropy, then this is going to be a positive exponent and this is going to blow up. So this is uh, the converse that I promised. That lemma is a single letter lemma. Right? It doesn't, it, no, no. So what happens if we have arbitrary statistics, mark or something you get? Uh, this is an excellent question. It's, it's an excellent question. We're actually working on it. So I, I um, stay tuned. Uh, I'll let you know what happens. Uh, I think it's actually a very interesting question uh, to, to, to understand what happens. Okay. Now I come to another issue which I promised you, which is how to define Renier. I'm oh, sorry, conditional Renier. And. Um, <coughs> Let me first give you the definition that I think is not the right one. So when I teach uh, information here and I talk about conditional entropy, I just say, well, condition, suppose you have x and y, some joint PMF PXY. Well, define, we know already what the entropy of x is. Now let's look at the entropy conditional on y given y. Once you conditional on y given y, you get a new PMF on x. This new PMF has some entropy, h of x given that y is equal to y. Let's average this over y. So this is how I usually uh, teach uh, or, or motivate conditional entropy. But this is kind of out of the blue. You know, if you kind of teach information theory somewhat axiomatically, then you just throw this definition and you move on. But if you actually wanted to think about what it really means, uh, conditional entropy, you would say, well, it's how many bits does it take to describe x if y is available to the describer and to the reconstructor? So let's take the second approach when we define, when we look at the, at the conditional Renyi entropy. And now what we have in mind is that uh, we have some y. So x, i, y, i are generated i, i, d according to some joint distribution p of x, y. y is some side information that is available to both the encoder and the decoder. <coughs> and now the question is, at what rates of uh, description can we actually guarantee list size tending to one, a uh, growth moment tending to one. So and if you like, if you go back to the uh, spouse situation, you can think about why it's being something that is common to you and your spouse. And it uh, may, may make it a little bit easier to understand which task it is that you're being assigned. All right, so now I want to solve this problem. This is the side information case. And um, here's a more formal uh, set up x i y i generated i d according to p x y y n sequence y n side information uh, rate r block length and source code with list decoder now we have a mapping from x sequences and y sequences to n r bits and the reconstruction is a subset of two to the x n and it's based on the n r bits that were conveyed uh, by your spouse and the side information of what you have in common uh, both of you. And the lossless property is the same lossless property. What we want to make sure is that the task you're assigned is an element of the reconstruction subset. And of course, now the reconstruction subset is a, is a function of the description and of the side information that is available at the decoder. And we're interested in the growth moment of this size. And uh, it turns out that there's a very simple, nice, elegant uh, theorem for this. Ignore this term for a moment. It says that if your rate is above something, 
<laughs> then there exists an encoder and decoder function such that the this set is going to be one. And if your rate is below this number, then this uh, growth moment is going to tend to infinity. And I hope I've somehow convinced you that uh, whatever this number is, this is some meaningful way of defining condition over the entropy. Um, so the h of x given y is <coughs> parameter 1 over 1 plus rho is what would make this work and this would be the condition over the entropy. Uh, it turns out that it has this form. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. It's not very difficult to prove this. The extension is actually fairly straightforward. And um, some of the properties are, the first three are the same as we've seen before. And now there's an additional one that says that um, like conditioning reduces entropy, uh, conditioning reduces also ring entropy. Of course, this is trivial at this point because uh, you can always ignore the side of common between you and your spouse, and that can't hurt. So therefore, you get this uh, equality maybe. The other three are the same, same arguments that we've seen before. And the first definition that you get is from the fourth property doesn't hold. Right. Is that true? Yeah. I actually didn't check, but I think it doesn't. It doesn't. But it, it, it's not a good definition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <coughs> I should say something before you know I, I um, I don't want to have any misunderstandings. I mean, you know, Rene entropy, of course, was uh, was suggested by Rene. He was he based it on some axiomatic approach, uh, and it was studied among others by uh, Chizar and a, a number of other uh, researchers uh, who have shown connections between that and error exponents for uh, uh, lossless source coding, etc. So you know, this is it, it's not the, you know the complete isolation that this uh, talk is is being given. Okay, so here's the direct part. It's actually, it's almost trivial at this point. It's the same idea. What you do is you have some side information sequence yn. Uh, let's say that it's of a type q. And now you look at the Vichy. In other words, what is the conditional type of uh, xn given yn? And we'll denote the Vichy by p. This can be a show. And uh, we partition this vision into two of the NR sub subsets that are roughly the size of the number of um, sequences in the, in the shell divided by two of the NR. And the number of sequences that have conditional uh, vision uh, V uh, given Yn is roughly two of the NH of V given Q. And so this is the, the, uh, the size of each of the sequence, of oh, the subsets of the vision that we're dealing with. Now, what we do is we describe first the V, or the conditional type of Xn given Yn, because there's a polynomial number of uh, conditional types, this is not going to cost us uh, asymptotically anything uh, linear in the plot length N. And uh, to describe um, uh, the task, what we do is we describe the Visha that contains it with negligible overhead. And then we describe a subset of TV that actually contains it. So um, if you, you work it out, you get the same kind of calculation, except that you need now a slightly different variational characterization of uh, any entropy. Again, you, you can do it with Lagrange multipliers or some other way. So this is a slightly different. Um, it turns out that actually this is not new. And this definition actually has appeared before. And this is uh, a definition that uh, Arimoto gave <coughs> for uh, conditional Rene entropy. And it's, uh, it's interesting what his motivation was. Completely different. Um, he wanted to define the capacity of order alpha for a channel. And he wanted this capacity of order alpha to be uh, proportional to Gallagher's E0 function. And he wanted it to have the form of Rene entropy minus conditional Rene entropy. And he tried to work out what should this be so that if I define C alpha in this way, I will end up with C, alpha, C of 1 over 1 plus rho being proportional to Gallagher's E0 function. 
So it has to do with not with source coding, but with uh, channels. And he showed that with this definition, it would work out. And this is why he suggested this is a, a conditional value. Uh, OK. Um, let me move on now to uh, uh, another variation on this problem. And this is when you actually have uh, a fidelity criterion. Yeah. Uh, do we get also the chain rule with, with this uh, conditional? Uh, um, you have to give no. The answer is no. Um, it, it, Randy entropy is not as well behaved as Shannon's entropy. And if you actually look at this problem, you'll see that it doesn't, you shouldn't expect it. In other words, usually we get it because we say, oh, to describe x and y, let's describe y and then describe x conditional on y. If you think about it offline, you'll see that in this setting, this doesn't make sense. We don't get it. OK, so the fidelity criterion is where um, there's a certain distortion. And you don't actually have to do the exact task that was assigned to you. But you should do a task that's close enough. So this is essentially the problem. So now we have a uh, source alphabet is x. We have a reconstruction alphabet, which is x hat. This is like the great distortion theory. And the uh, mapping or the reconstruction is from these nr bits that uh, are the description of the task to a subset of uh, x hat to the n. And the lossless property is, well, the, I shouldn't say lossless, the, the property that we insist on is that no matter what the task was, among the uh, subsets of, that we're going to perform, there's one that is of distortion d. From, uh, from the truth. This is the, the variation on the same thing. So if you like, if you just take this hamming and make this equal to zero, you get exactly the lossless case. Uh, the lossy case just says that I want to be within distortion D of the sequence that was generated by the source. And again, I can look at the growth uh, this size. And this might give me a sense of what it means to have any rate distortion function. So this is what I'm after. What, what is the reasonable description, uh, definition of a mean rate distortion function? And um, it turns out that things work out nicely. There's some something. Let's not worry about what the something is right now. If your rate is above that something, then you can find encoder and reconstruction sequence uh, subsets uh, such that the um, you're guaranteed that the distortion is going to be of at least one of the reconstruction sequences is going to be the distortion D of the true one, and the growth moment is going to go to one. And if your rate is below this magic number, uh, the list growth moment of this uh, the size is going to tend to infinity. Right. And this is what I'd like to argue is perhaps what we should call Rennie rate distortion function for your uh, source. And uh, of course, I didn't tell you what it is. Uh, this is actually turns out to be the answer. So. What you have to do is, suppose that RQD is the regular Shannon rate distortion function for the source of distribution Q and the distortion D. Let's take R of Q of D minus rho inverse DQP, that is the relative entropy between the true source distribution and this thing. Maximize that over Q. And this is what R rho uh, R means. This is the... Uh, and um, it's actually easy to see the, 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 the direct part to try to understand what this actually means. So here's that direct part very quickly. Uh, the point is that if your um, source generates a sequence of type Q, we know that with RQD, we can, uh, two to the end RQD reconstruction sequences should suffice to guarantee that there's at least one that is within distortion D of the uh, source sequence. And what we do is, for each one of these Qs, uh, we partition these reconstruction sequences to two li lists of length 2 to the n r q d minus r. And then um, we use a very small number of bits to actually describe the type Q of xn. And then we use nr bits to describe the list that contains the reconstruction sequence that is within distortion d of that uh, sequence. We work out what the um, 
expected, uh, or what's the growth moment of this? Uh, we have here a sum over Q. We, we cross the number of types to polynomial. We can upper bound the sum by roughly the largest term. The largest term is going to give us this expression over here. And this is exactly the end. what we have. So it's the max over Q, RQD minus rho inverse to Q. Rho is always between 0 and 1, right? Uh, rho is between 0 and infinity. 0 and infinity. Yes. But it corresponds to alpha being between 0 and 1. You didn't, you didn't have a constraint at one point the row between zero and uh, no, no, what it is is the row is between uh, alpha is between zero alpha and is between zero and one. Like the row is between zero and plus infinity. Always. Uh, Everything between, you said. Yes, yeah. So, so in particular, for example, your constraint problem has the constraint on the moment which is not uh, typically on P space. Yes. So uh, let me just make sure that I was uh, because I saw something with the row between zero. One over one plus rho is alpha. Yeah, right. So uh, alpha uh, rho tending to zero will give you something which is slightly above one, and uh, no, rho no. tending to infinity will give you. Yeah. The, the, the constraint is yeah. on the on the rho moment. Yes. yes. So rho could be, for example, one half. Yes. Between zero and one, right? And it's not not LP. That's what you mean. Yeah. yeah. Right. So it's, yeah. it's not really a, a norm. Right? Right. Are those interesting cases? Between zero and one? Uh, well, it gives you the whole range of oh, oh the row being between yeah, zero and one. I don't know. Okay. Um, in some sense, the question of what is the meaningful row is you know, no, no, depends I, on how risk averse you are or no, how, how lazy you are in terms yeah. of performing the task. It puts emphasis on different parts of the distribution. Sure. I must say, what is the, that, that quantity within the curly brackets, RQD minus yeah. Q, yeah. Okay, so somehow, the, in, in the operational sense, you're fixing a channel between the input and the, and the, and the reproduced version. As in rate distortion theory, you, there's, there's a W. Yes, but the W depends on your Q. On the Q, right? Yes. So, does it somehow, what is the corresponding uh, analog of W in this case? Like, is there such a thing? In other words, in rate distortion theory, there's a minimizing W that minimizes the initial information. Yes. Is there a significance of that sort that comes through that expression? Is that expression corresponds? Uh, I, mean, I don't have to think about this. It's not certain information radius of some kind, right? The second term. Right? Mm -hmm. But of course, it somehow depends on Q, which is what. Uh, so, in other words, your true distribution is P, yeah. and this uh, reverse channel that right. shows up here depends on Q. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, is it a solution to an optimization problem? No. Yes. What is uh, sad about it is has no P in it. It has no P. In it. So somehow it, it can't be associated with the source. So there is no conditional distribution that you see out here. No, I don't think so. Okay, that's right. Um, I'm a little bit, I don't know what to do here. Hang on a second. Let me. Yes. Right, will I? Uh, the Congress will take me about five minutes. So, uh, should we? No, no, it's fine. Okay. Um, all right, so let me just give you um, uh, the <coughs> idea of the Congress for this result. Um, the problem is, of course, that we want to use this wonderful lemma. But the, the, the moments that we're looking at have to do with the reconstruction alphabet. And the probabilities that we're given and, uh, are related, of course, to the source alphabet, X. So somehow you need to, to uh, map one into the other. And let me show you how to do that. So first of all, I claim that without loss of generality, this is the same idea that we've seen before. The reconstruction subset of M and of M prime when M is not equal to M prime should be disjoint. It doesn't make sense to put the same reconstruction sequence in two different subsets. Uh, just take it out from the longer, this way you can shorten it. So once you do that, then of course the, um, uh, the reconstruction subsets form a partition of this. Okay, so this is all the possible reconstruction sequences. And now we actually have a partition of that. 
And that means that to each reconstruction sequence that is in, uh, in this in here, there's a unique index or, or a unique um, subset that contains it. And now we can define a function g that maps source sequences into reconstruction sequences. And what it does is, it's, it's not unique, but there exists a such a function, if you've given me a valid uh, code, that such that uh, gn of xn is going to be inside this subset and within distortion d of xn. So this is a um, uh, function g that I'm after. So basically, what I want to say is that you give me a sequence x, I can map into some reconstruction <coughs> sequence which lies inside this subset. There may be a few of them that are within distortion d, but I just pick one of them. This already gives me a mapping from x sequences to x hat sequences. And now what I want to do is I want to shift the calculation of the uh, uh, list size uh, and write it in terms of the reconstruction sequence. And this is all I've done here. So this is not particularly new. Um, here's your list size. And I've written it in terms of all the reconstruction sequences x hat n by uh, this is the, um, the list corresponding to them. And this is the probability that the source sequence will be such that its description is going to fall inside this n of xn. So it's just a, a rewriting of things just so that I can do it in terms of the distribution on the reconstruction sequence. And this is the distribution of the reconstruction sequences that I'm interested in. Okay, so it's, uh, it's, the, it's uh, the, the, the probability of some reconstruction sequence is just uh, the probability of all the source sequences that are going to, going to be mapped to it. And this is a way of moving my probability distribution from x n to x hat n. This is this x hat n. Okay. So now uh, we can apply the lemma to the random variable x hat n. In other words, this is the, the uh, application of the function g to the source sequence. And this is just a direct application of this thing. Um, and of course, what happens here is that it shows up as 1 over m, which is 2 to the, 2 to the minus nr. And now I have the uh, Remy entropy of order 1 over 1 plus rho, but applied to this p tilde, the distribution of the reconstruction sequences. And somehow I need to relate this to the Remy entropy on the uh, source sequences, on the x uh, sequences and not the x hat sequences. So just based on this lemma, really what I want to show is that h of 1 over 1 plus rho of this p tilde, the distribution of the x hat sequences, is larger than what I claim to be the Remy rate distortion function n times R of d. <coughs> now, this function, uh, this distribution pn is just a distribution on x uh, passed through a, a channel, if you like. And the channel is a deterministic channel that maps the sequence uh, uh, xn to g of xn. This is the relationship. But of course, it's not single letter. This is what the problem <coughs> is. So um, suppose now that Q star achieves R rho of D. This is the function that we're after. Uh, Remy ray distortion function. So in other words, R rho of D is just R of Q star D minus rho in this D Q star Px. So this is what achieves the, the maximum of the definition of R Q of D. And, um, From the variational characterization of Rainy entropy, we know that the Rainy entropy of p tilde is lower bounded by h of q minus rho inverse dq. For every q, every q that we choose, this is the variational characterization of, of <coughs> the Rainy entropy. And now I need to choose some q here that is going to be useful. Anyone will give me a lower bound. What I choose is, of course, the result of taking q star to the end and passing it through this channel, which maps x sequences to x hat sequences. And this is what I did. So take this in here and plug in this distribution. This is the first time that this is important. Now, this 
is an interesting form. What we have here is the relative entropy induced at the channel output when you feed it with Q star to the n versus P x to the n. And we have a data processing inequality for relative entropy that says that when you take two input distributions to a channel, the relative entropy between the output distributions can only decrease. So I replace this relative entropy of the channel outputs with the relative entropy between the channel inputs. Now, these are, of course, uh, IID. So the relative entropy between two IID distributions is n times uh, the relative entropy between the marginals. And this is the simplification that we can here. Now compare this guy with this guy. You see that they're actually uh, the same. So really, all I need to do now is show you that this is greater or equal than R2 star to the power. So this is the last step of this. So um, this turns out to be a simple application of the, it's, it's a variation on the, on the converse and rate distortion theory. So we Xn tilde are generated IAD Q star. Xn hat is the application of, of uh, G2 then. Uh, this is just uh, the entropy of Xn hat, and because there's a deterministic mapping between the x sequences and the x hats, I can also write this in mutual information. And I know by the reconstruction property that the distortion between the tildes and the hats is upper bounded by d. So now I can use the classical converse and rate distortion <coughs> to argue that this mutual information is greater than the rate distortion function uh, for the source. So this is, uh, it's a little bit technical, and I can yeah, my son, I can tell how boring it is. Um, but this is sort of the idea of, of the converse, and there's some details that we need to go Turns out that this is also not boring. Uh, but before I tell you that, here's an example. This is what happens when you have a binary source with timing distortion. So uh, x and x hat is 0, 1. The source is Bernoulli p, timing distortion. This is the regular rate distortion function source. And if you look at the Rémy rate distortion function, it's the same thing but with the entropy of the source replaced by the uh, Rémy entropy of the source. Uh, this one doesn't change. It's just this guy that actually changes. Um, so when rho increases, the R rho of B should increase, right? Here's, uh, here's what happens. Okay. So uh, this is rho, uh, rho uh, uh, 0. This is rho tending uh, to infinity, and this is there. OK, um, why is this not new? Well, it turns out that this function actually has appeared before. And the work of uh, Erdal and Neri, and, and in fact, some of the analytic uh, properties that we needed, uh, we could find in their paper, so it's actually very useful for us. Uh, so this function has actually appeared before in their work, and it, it's related to guessing. Turns out that this is the connection. So they were interested in a completely different problem, and this is uh, their motivation. The idea was that there's a source generated IID according to distribution P, and think about guessing the outcome. So you, have, you sequentially guess uh, the outcome. And this is the sequence of guesses that you perform. And each guess is a reconstruction sequence. <coughs> x1 hat n, x2 it, and so forth. This is the first guess, the second guess, etc. And you want to know how long will it take you before you guess correctly, in the sense that the distortion between your guess and the true sequence is upper bounded by you. Uh, of course, this is a random uh, quantity. And you can look at its uh, uh, the, uh, the, the moments, the Rolf moments of this. And they prove that as n tends to infinity, it's, uh, the limit is R uh, rho of d. So it's actually the same R rho of d that we ended up with is uh, the one that they end up with for this. Uh, this. OK, so, um, so the minimization is of all the possible order. Yes, so all the different ways for which order of guesses. Um, so just to recap, uh, I think the point is that if you mentally replace the idea of a message 
by the task, you're no longer interested in probabilities of error. You're interested in the expected number of tasks that you would have to perform. And if you do that, then you get some uh, operational characterizations of um, uh, Rennie entropy, albeit for alpha between 0 and 1, uh, conditional Rennie entropy, and uh, the Rennie rate distortion function, if you like. I, I don't know if this is an appropriate name. Um, there is one thing that's missing here. The information theorist here might be a bit bummed that there's no capacity. Where is the Rennie capacity? Uh, this turns out to be a much harder problem, which is related to um, zero undetected uh, uh, capacity, and it's related to a situation where a decoder ha has to generate this, a list of messages that are guaranteed to contain the correct one, and you want to study the growth moments of that. And it's uh, to be really imprecise. Um, the way the computational cutoff rate relates to channel capacity is like the way this quantity relates to the zero undetected uh, error capacity. So and it's, it's an interesting object in its own right. And um, if you're interested in this, we have a paper about this uh, where we actually uh, study it in the presence of feedback. In general, it's so open to actually find out what this is, as is the zero undetected error capacity. So uh, with this, uh, I'll stop here and thank you for your patience. Thank you very much. Questions? The only difference if I look at your expression for the computer is PX1 is one is the probability of X given one times the probability of one. So because of <coughs> R or one over rho the pops out of the uh, sum, and the reason why this is the correct guess comes from the proof that we're given in the operational significance. Yes. So almost the difference between the first quantity and the second, which is not negative, is there? Uh, first one and the second. Yes. Uh, does it uh, correspond to any known notion of alpha divergence or rho divergence, uh, Rennie divergence? Um, it turns out that uh, it is related in some sense to um, the problem that I just mentioned. So this, um, uh, if you replace the um, if you replace the zero undetected error capacity with this similar thing for lists, and you actually study what happens uh, when you have uh, feedback, then uh, you get that uh, the, in some sense, dual of the computational cutoff rate <coughs> is exactly this difference. Mm -hmm. But th there's a, a slight caveat to that, but yes, this is sort of where. Uh, so it's a little bit like a, a cutoff in certain senses. And the second thing is that the row that you have is between zero and infinity, which corresponds to alpha between zero and one. Yes. Now, because of the way you pose the problem, you, you, the question, because of the question you asked, you, you get an effect of results which deal with the Rennie entropy of order alpha between zero and one. Are there any problems for which in an operational sense, the Rennie entropy of order bigger than one uh, comes out as a number. Uh, I'm not familiar with one. So I think in source coding, error exponents, it's again only between zero yeah, and one. Yeah. If my memory serves me right. And the, in these guessing problems that I mentioned here, it's also between zero and one. So I have not yet seen any uh, operational meaning for, for alpha. Maybe I'll then just I, I can't think of it. Any other questions? I didn't understand. Why is the dual problem, the, the capacity problem related to zero undetected error rather than just just list 
It's not less decoding, right? No, it's, it's not less decoding. What you want is, so the problem in some sense is that um, based on the channel output, you want to form a, a list that is guaranteed to contain mm -hmm. Guarantee uh, the correct message. message yes. Yes. And this is, this, yes. this is where it yes. kind of... Yes, yes, I understand. So yes. if you didn't allow a list, but you said you wanted... Uh, uh, in other words, if you didn't look at the moments, but you just wanted... Um, the, the probability of the list being larger than one uh, to go to zero, you would end up with uh, zero undetected error. Yes. Just like here, you end up with uh, entropy yes. instead of ring entropy. Yes. So this, in this sense, there's uh, some interesting uh, dual dualities. It's, it's not what we usually think about when we talk about list, uh, list decoding. No, for list decoding we allow an error to begin with. Yes, so here there, there are no errors. So it's, it's a zero error problem with lists. But it's a zero error in the sense that it's what we call zero undetected error. Undetected error. error. Undetected. Yes. So it's, it's, it's different from the zero error. Capacity. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there, there are a lot of uh, very interesting open problems related to these uh, objects. The zero undetected error capacity and this, etc. This is very interesting stuff. Um, um, I think Prakash knows tons about it. And, uh, this um, was also studied by Swede, uh, <coughs> who was uh, interested in this. Um, and we have some uh, a recent work on that also. So if, you know, offline, I can tell you. It, it, it turns out to be related to, um, so the zero error capacity is related to graph capacities, mm -hmm. and uh, the zero undetected error capacity is related to sperner capacities. Yes, I see, I see. Yeah, sure. Uh, so so the, the answer to your question, uh, rate distortion question, and uh, coincide with the uh, the answer to the guessing problem, yes. right? So can you show some uh, direct relationship between your problem and the guessing problem, I mean, operational relationship? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So based on toying, playing around with it a little bit, we didn't see it. Um, it, it, it has, it, it, you know, the answers are very similar. In, in some sense, the problems are the question yeah. makes yes. a lot of I, sense. I, I'm interested in, in, in the IIT case, your question, the answer to your question, and the, the answer to the case in context. So this coincidence also goes <coughs> for beyond IIT case. Uh, so we have work in progress now about the non-IIT case, but I, I don't have anything to report yet, so I should probably shut up. Well, thank you very much for coming to the meeting.